you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Exodus chapter 5. It's the chapter that we're going to be in tonight. We're going to be talking about opposition. I had a, as Mike was taking requests, was asking about people who've had a chance, an opportunity to share the gospel um, over the past week, or even before that, and I think we all, to some degree, have felt opposition when sharing the gospel, opposition when talking about our faith, this opposition that comes when you're presenting somebody with the truth and they don't want to hear about it. We all, to some degree, struggle with opposition in various different areas of life, but when it comes to uh, our faith, it can often be the most difficult because we have a heart, we have a burden for people to receive the Word, and yet when they don't, it puts a great weight on our chest. And so it's good that we we pray and we lift up these things to the Lord, we plant the seeds, another one waters, but ultimately it's God who causes the growth. And in our chapter for this evening, we're going to be looking at the beginning of opposition, We talked about how in the call of Moses, Moses was told by God that God was going to harden Pharaoh's heart and that Moses was going to face opposition. He was going to go before Pharaoh. He was going to ask Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go and God said Pharaoh was going to say no. And so we have here in Exodus 5 this this first beginning of opposition. Chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey His voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. Moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice the Lord our God, lest He fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. The king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Go back to your burdens. You have this initial encounter with Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh. And they say, let my people go. For what reason? So they can go into the wilderness and have a feast before the Lord. And when he clarifies after Pharaoh says no, he says, let us go a three days journey. Now, what's up with this? Is God's intent in sending Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh to only bring Israel out for three days so then Israel can then go back to Egypt and be slaves? Back in the call of Moses, God told them, this is what you're going to say to Pharaoh. You're going to say, let us go out a three days journey that we may worship the Lord. So what's going on here? Because a three days journey for a feast to sacrifice the Lord and coming back doesn't really seem like any sort of salvation for Israel. So why is this the offer that's given to Pharaoh? Why is this the request that's made? Well, God, in His infinite knowledge and in His infinite wisdom, He knows that Pharaoh isn't going to let them go. And so He begins by telling Moses to give even just this very simple request. Let us go and worship for three days so that the anger of our Lord does not fall upon us, so that He does not send pestilence upon us, because if God sends pestilence on us, then we can't do any work for you. So it seems like in the best interest of both of us for you to let us go three days' journey and then come back. And I think the point behind this, we're not, we're not explicitly told, but I believe the point behind going a three days journey and this being the request is, if Pharaoh isn't even going to allow this, why would he ever allow them to go forever? Why would he ever let them out of his hand? And in essence, this is a display of how hard Pharaoh's heart is toward God and how proud uh, how proud Pharaoh is in his own heart. 
Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh and they say, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. God is saying this to Pharaoh on behalf of the people, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. So God is claiming ownership over these people. But Pharaoh's response is as we, we've been talking about for a number of weeks now, but now we actually hear him say it, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? Who is this God? I don't know him. I don't know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. Pharaoh, believing himself to be a God, says, no, they're not your people, they're my people. And they will stay here and they will serve me. They will not go out into the wilderness three days to worship you. They will not go out into the wilderness three days to serve you. They will stay right here and they will serve me. And when Moses and Aaron say, it's the God of the Hebrews that met with us. This is the Lord. Please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice the Lord our God lest He fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. So they go and they make this request and Pharaoh's response is, no. They are my people. They are not the Lord's people. And why are you trying to remove them from their work? So stop nagging me and go back to your burdens. Go back to your work. In verse 5, and Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many. I know where we heard this before. There are many. Back in chapter 1, and Pharaoh recognizes that the people of Israel become numerous. He tries to reduce their numbers. And here you have a very similar sentiment linking this Pharaoh back to the Pharaoh that tried to wipe out many of them, saying his heart has not changed at all. And so he says, Behold, the people of the land are now many. Do you make them rest from their burdens? Yes, Fred. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a good, good point. So if you, you didn't hear, Fred's comment was... Uh, the, the request is that they go into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord for three days, have a feast, but this predates the law. So you don't, have, you don't have the regulations for the five regular feasts and then the feast of ordination, um, and those sacrifices going along, or sorry, the five sacrifices and then the sacrifice of ordination and the three yearly feasts. You don't have those taking place. So what is the sacrifice that's going on here? Why do they go into the wilderness? And we do see, as Fred mentioned, you know, some beforehand, but we don't really have a regulation for this. Um, there's different speculation, but most often the thought would be that this would likely be some sort of whole burnt offering. Uh, that even before the law, there was whole burnt offerings as an act of worship. As some will also argue predating the law, there were sin offerings. Um, and so some will make, make that that claim, but what we do see is we see whole burnt offerings and we do see grain offerings given uh, prior to this. Whereas in an act of worship and an act of thanks and an act of rejoicing to the Lord their God, they would take a certain animal, they would drain the blood, and then they would put it on an altar and they would light it on fire and the whole thing would burn up. And it was an act of worship to the Lord and it is one of the five sacrifices that we later see uh, a little bit in Exodus, but specifically in the first few chapters um, of Leviticus. And so we don't know exactly what the sacrifice is, um, what kind of sacrifice, but the lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword gives the implication that the refusal of them to go out would then bring upon the judgment of God, meaning that this is something that God would expect, which kind of raises another question, doesn't it? Why now? Is this something that they've requested in the past? We're not told, but it doesn't seem that way. Why, why now, after all these hundreds of years, is this request being made? 
Perhaps it's because it's a new Pharaoh, and the old Pharaoh has died, and now God sends Moses back, so the people who are seeking his life are now dead. There are a number of questions that, that raise here, but ultimately the sacrifice that is going to take place is what's supposed to take place at Sinai, where you have the purification, where you have the ordination of the priesthood, where you have the giving of the law, where you have the whole burnt offering, and yet when they do go out to make that sacrifice, they end up perverting it by worshiping the golden calf. Pharaoh is not happy with what's going on. He's not happy with this request, and he recognizes that the people are many, and he accuses them, saying, you make them rest from their burden. And so Pharaoh's response is, verse 6, then the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. For the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and, and pay no regard to lying words. So Pharaoh's response to all of this is, well, these people are just very lazy. They're lazy because they have the time to think about going out into the wilderness and sacrificing as if they have the time to rest from their work, to be able to go do this, and that the progress wouldn't stop. And so Pharaoh says, well, if they think they have the time and they're acting lazy, well, let's just increase the work. Instead of us providing the straw for them to make bricks, they need to go out, gather the straw, then they need to come back, they need to process the straw within the mud for when they make the bricks for the work that they are doing. And Pharaoh says in verse 9, let heavier work be laid on the men. The word heavier there is one of the words that's going to show up very frequently in the first 14 chapters of Exodus. It's the same word for Pharaoh hardening his heart and God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh's response to God's call to let the people go is, well, let's just increase their work. Let's make things heavier for them. And this is a big mistake because the heaviness that Pharaoh is going to put upon the people will pale in comparison to the heaviness God is going to put upon Pharaoh in Egypt in the plagues. But Pharaoh, not being a very wise individual, because he will not let the people go. He will not listen to the Lord. Verse 10, So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task each day, as when there was straw. And the four men of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your work in making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? And so inevitably, because the amount of work has increased greatly, with them having to go out great distances to gather straw, they're not completing all the work that is expected to do of, of them. And so then the taskmasters are taking these four men and then they're beating them. This is the first interaction with Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh. And the first intera interaction goes exactly as God says. Pharaoh's not going to listen. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to show the world my wonders. And Moses and Aaron face this oppression, this opposition from Pharaoh. But not just them, the entire nation does. And the persecution increases. And so it begs the question, well then how is Israel going to respond to this? Verse 15, And the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants. Yet you say to us, Make bricks. Behold, your servants are beaten. 
but the fault is your own fault. That's a pretty bold statement for these individuals to make to Pharaoh. This is your own fault that the work's not being done because you have increased the work to an unreasonable amount. It's your fault that we're not getting the work done. The Pharaoh responds in verse 17, but he said, You are idle. You are idle. That is why you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh, and they said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us stink. In the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. So you have these four men, likely some of them being a part of the initial group, or connected quite significantly to the initial group that Moses and Aaron went before, when they said the Lord is with us to deliver us out of the hand of the Egyptians. And now you have these four men. Their response is because of this oppression, because of the opposition that they are now facing, their response to Moses and Aaron is, the Lord look upon you and judge. This is not a positive statement. It even has the implication that, well, with what's going on, this is not from the hand of the Lord. Because things aren't going easy. He's not bringing salvation. In fact, He's increased our work. So the Lord look upon you and judge, because you have made us a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. What's interesting is this, this phrase is very much like what Jacob says to his two sons, Simeon and Levi. After they wipe out the entire village, after one of the leader's sons had raped their sister. And after they slaughter the village, the, Jacob's response is, now you've made me stink to all the people around. They're going to want to come and they're going to want to kill me. And what am I going to do? We're few in numbers. We can't raise up an army to support ourselves against these nations is Jacob's thought. And his two sons in reply to him, they say, should the man be allowed to defile our sister? Raising the question, should not this sinful deed Should this sinful deed be left unpunished? And so they take judgment into their their own hands. And here the response is, the Lord look and judge you because you have made us a stink in the sight of Pharaoh. So they're not saying, well, we're bringing this judgment upon you, but at the same time, they are making this judgment. You made us a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put the sword in their hand to kill us. And so the people, it's, it seems like now, well, now they're starting to shrink back because there's opposition. And things are getting hard. But you know, we still have Moses and Aaron, right? Solid guys. Ready to go the distance. Verse 22, Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people and, have, and you have not delivered your people at all. Moses has a beautiful response, doesn't he? You didn't catch my sarcasm there. These men say to him, the Lord look on you and judge. And then Moses says, Lord, why have you done this evil? Why have you done this it's a horrible thing to these people. Why did you ever send me? Moses back in chapter 4 giving some pushback. Saying, I don't think I'm the right guy for you to send. God says, no, you're the right guy. Moses gives more pushback. No, I don't think so. And God says, okay, well, I'll send Aaron. But you're still going to go. And so Moses goes. And now he goes. And even though he's warned that he's going to face 
opposition, and God is going to use this opposition, the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, to bring himself glory, to save Israel with a strong hand, so that all of Israel, all of Egypt, and all the world know that it wasn't by Israel's own power that they were saved, but it was by the hand, the mighty hand, the hard hand of God. That is how he is going to save his people. But Moses here seems to be going back to a little bit of his ways back at Sinai not too long ago because now it's as if he is starting to accuse God. And he says, why have you done this evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people and you have not delivered your people at all. God, you promised you're going to deliver them. Doesn't look like it. In fact, their work is harder. People are being beaten. Doesn't seem like you're working at all. Where are you? Why'd you send me here? Now the people hate me. We're all a stink to Pharaoh. Now we're all worse off than before. Now we're not going to get into chapter, we're not going to really discuss chapter 6 until next week, but the first verse is important because it it's in essence God's response to this. In verse 1 it says, But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, it's one of those two key words, with a heavy hand, strong hand, he, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, the mighty hand, the heavy hand, he will drive them out of his land. Pharaoh has put upon the people heavy burdens. He has a heavy hand. Heavy being the same word for glory as well. And now in contrast to this, God says, this heavy hand that He is afflicting the people with, this same heavy hand He is going to use in a heavy way to say, get out of my land. This same word is used later to speak about how the Egyptians urged and forced the people to go in haste, with heaviness, to go quickly. Because they didn't want all of them to be wiped out in these great plagues of God. The Lord's response to Moses is, you're going to face opposition and you're only, going to face, you're only facing a little bit because a lot more is going to come. And God elaborates that as this continues. But what do we do when we face opposition? What is our response? Are we... Bold, as we later see Joshua and Caleb. Twelve spies go to the land of Canaan. And you know the song. Well, you at least know the first part of the song because we've referenced it numerous times between myself and between Mike in Sunday school. Twelve men went to spy on Canaan. You get the fun actions. Ten were bad and two were good. You want me to continue? <laughs> what did they do when they... I don't even know the words. Uh, but what happened when they went and spied on Canaan? Right? Ten were bad and two were good. Some saw giants big and tall. Some saw grapes and clusters fall. Two men saw God in it all. Twelve men went to spy on Canaan. Ten were bad and two were good. I think I got it close enough. When they came back, the ten men gave a bad report. And the two men, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, the Lord is with us. What was the response of the ten men? Let's kill them. Let's kill the two that say the Lord is with us. Because they're going to bring us into the land. They're going to give courage to the people to go into the land. And we're all going to die. Because clearly God is not with us. Even though this is the same people that saw all the events that we're going to cover in the next, uh, well, we'll cover them in the new year. But these plagues, they witnessed all this. They witnessed the Red Sea parting. They witnessed manna coming down from heaven six days a week and on the sixth day a double portion for the Sabbath. They've seen the hand of God over and over and over and yet when they get to Canaan, they, uh, well, I'm not too sure. I don't think God is with us. Why? Because now they're seeing a little bit of opposition. Are we more like the people of Israel, when 
things get hard, then they shrink back. Are we more like Moses at this point? Now, Moses grows. Moses, being a man of faith, he makes mistakes. And this is clearly one of his mistakes. But he grows. And he becomes bold. And he becomes courageous. And he becomes a speaker of the people. man with a heavy tongue presents the book of Deuteronomy as his last sermon to the people. And if you were uh, at the meeting last night, getting close to, what, five hours long, well, add on another hour of that, and that was about how long Moses' sermon was in Deuteronomy. Long sermon. And Moses grows. And that should give us encouragement. But what, what do we do when we face opposition? Are we courageous? Are we bold? That doesn't mean not having any fear. It does not mean not having any anxiety in the moment about what's going on. But to be courageous is to give it up to the Lord, to rely on His strength. Nor do we, when we face opposition, do we shrink back and say, oh, Lord, why did you call me to go and talk to that person? It didn't go so well. Why did you send me to this area to do this work? Things are not going well. What do we do when we face opposition? Moses, as it seems now, has a little bit of a track record of running. As some would argue. Here he's facing opposition and he's questioning the call of God upon his life. Now, I hadn't planned on, on this, but I've changed my ending of the sermon based off of the song that was chosen. Uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. Does anybody know the story behind that song? It's an amazing story. If you, if you look at the song in your hymnal, it, it, when it says the text, it'll say, Source Unknown. Is they don't know the name of the person, But they have an idea based off of the story and the work. There was a man who was called to be a missionary, uh, went to one of the tribes in India, became a missionary there with his family, and they were preaching the gospel, and they began to face some opposition. And it got to the point that the tribal leader dragged the man and his family before the entire tribe, and he said to the man, Recant your faith. Tell the people that what you have been saying, tell, tell them it's lies. Or I will kill your children. And the man had wrote a song before, and his response in that moment was to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And they proceeded to kill his children. They turn to him again, and they say, Recant your faith, or we will kill your wife. And he goes on and says, The cross before me. I'm blanking on the words. How does the verse go? Yes, the world behind me, the cross before me. I always get the two lines mixed up. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. And they proceed to kill his wife. And then they turn to him and they say, recant your faith or we will kill you. And he finishes by singing, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. And then they killed him. A short time later, the man's testimony convicted the tribal leader to such a degree that he went before his entire tribe and he repented, and he confessed that he now believes in the God that this man proclaimed, the God that this man died for. And as a result, a revival broke out in this community. And that's the story. And you go in your hymnals and it says source anonymous. They don't know the name of the person, but they do know the story behind it. 
And really, the name's not important, is it? You don't need to know who it was. Why? All glory be to God. The man, when he's faced with his opposition, it's not just opposition of him. It's not just this threat on his life. It's the life of his entire family. And yet, he looks at the cross before him and he says, I can't turn back. I've made this decision. My family's made this decision. And though there's this opposition, though there's this oppression, though there's this threat of death for not just me, but for my family, I will not turn back. And so his whole family becomes this great testimony, not just to that tribe, but then to us who hear this story. And not just him, but the hundreds and thousands of others who have similar stories where they stand boldly for their faith despite the oppression that they go through. And we don't like suffering. We don't like to go through persecution. We don't like it when we share and people get angry with us. And yet, this is something that we are going to face as believers because when presented with the truth, some people get very angry. In Romans chapter 5, we'll close with this. Romans chapter 5, in verse 1, Paul says, Therefore we have been justified by faith. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him... We have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we'd rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord. Rejoice in the fact that we are saved. But not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We rejoice not only in our salvation, but we also rejoice in our suffering because suffering produces within us an endurance. The ability to push through, though oftentimes it feels like we don't have any strength to do so. And this endurance produces a character. Because if we continue to endure, as we continue to be faithful, though we will make mistakes, and though we will not always act as the way that we should, and maybe not even respond in those situations as we ought to, if we keep pushing forward in endurance, it produces a character in us. That our responses then become more in line with Scripture. More in line with the nature of Christ. His character. And His character produces a hope. It produces an assurance in us because hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Meaning, we do not walk alone. When we face this opposition, ultimately, the opposition is against God Himself. Now, we are receiving opposition But when they say no to us, when they get hostile with us, ultimately they're being hostile towards God. And yet the Holy Spirit has been given to us richly. He's been poured out upon us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. We see here in our text opposition and oppression being put upon the people. And we see this shrinking back where, well, now we become a stink in the eyes of Pharaoh. And we see this shrinking back for Moses. Why did you send me? And this generation that said, you made us a stink in Pharaoh's eyes, well, they go on to grumble some more and complain some more. They go on to not act in faith. But Moses is one who, though at this time, he doesn't respond rightly. He responds poorly. We see as time continues, Moses grows. 
And as Moses faces more opposition, more oppression, more suffering, it builds an endurance in him. And as he continues, though he continues to make mistakes, though at times he continues to have poor responses, I mean, he was dealing with these people for 40 years in the wilderness. These were not the easiest people to deal with. They'd just been told that they're going to all die out there. Again and again and again we read, continuing on in Exodus and then in Leviticus and Numbers, Deuteronomy, we read several examples of when the people rebel against Moses and against Aaron and rebel against the Lord. He not only faces oppression from Pharaoh, but then he faces oppression and resistance and persecution from the very people that he helped lead out of, his, out of Egypt. And yet this endurance produces in him a character. And his character, a hope. And when he gives his final sermon in Deuteronomy before his death, you can see this hope shining through. Even though he knows he will not enter the promised land. He still knows God is good. He still knows God will keep His promises. That, he will, that the people will be brought into the promised land through the hand of Joshua. And ultimately, the people will be brought into the promised land by the hand of the true and better Joshua. And being Jesus. Joshua being the Hebrew name for Jesus. And so the exhortation for us when we come to a passage like Exodus 5, though we, we look at Moses and we think, what in the world is your response? Why would you do that? It, it's clearly evident that God is with you. He spoke to you in the burning bush. He gave you all these details. He even told you you're going to face this. Are we much different when Jesus says to us, know that the world will hate you because the world hates me. You will face persecution, but know I am with you. I have overcome the world, so have peace. Despite all of these things that are going on, because if you have peace with God, it doesn't matter how much opposition you face from men, you have the true peace that matters. You don't need peace with men. You need peace with God. And if men refuse to have peace with you, use that as a means to rejoice that hope is being built up in you. Knowing that the God who has saved you, who has justified you by faith, is faithful to you. And when we make mistakes, as we see Moses, we have a mediator with God. We have been justified. It's not that we lose this peace with God. We have an eternal peace because the conflict has been restored through the blood of Christ. And so we have a mediator in Christ that we can go before the Lord, that we can ask for His forgiveness, knowing that He has already forgiven us if we are in Christ. And we continue to push on and we continue to grow. And we continue to build a character that produces hope through our sufferings, through our endurance, knowing that hope does not put us to shame and that God's Spirit richly dwells in us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for, for chapters like Exodus 5 which depict the, this persecution that Your people face. Lord, the request was for them to be let go. And Lord, though on this occasion we do not see a good response from, from anybody in this chapter, Lord, as we continue reading through, we know that You are still faithful. Lord, that You made a promise to bring them out of Egypt. And Lord, You did so. Lord, we thank You that we can rejoice in our sufferings, the things that we go through. And not just suffering in persecution, but even just suffering in general that we go through. Suffering because of the hurts that we face. Even the suffering that we receive because of Your discipline upon us. Knowing that Your discipline is intended for us 
to become more holy, to become more like you, and in so doing, to build in us an endurance, a better character, and a stronger hope. Lord, I pray that we would cling strongly to this hope, that we would cling strongly to your Spirit who has who has indwelled us, who is our strength, who is our guide. And Lord, when we come into situations where we face opposition and oppression, Lord, that we would remain strong. Even if that means suffering with great cost. As we saw in even just one example this evening. Lord, I pray that we would be a faithful people. We long to honor You in all that we do. To You be the glory forever. In Jesus' name, Amen.